1920s were full of glitz and glamour and also part of what's known as the golden age of golf with courses popping up all over the country. But as many past institutions in America, unfortunately not everyone was always welcomed at those courses. In the nation's capital, African Americans fight overall equality extended beyond the golf course. In honor of Black History Month, we celebrate their story, narrated by the Washington DC native, actor Jeffrey Wright. Of all the stages of the civil rights movement, the buses, the bridges, the restaurant counters, this was its grandest. I have a dream today. But less than five miles from those marble steps of equality is another gathering place, a clubhouse of common ground. This is Washington, D.C., a place of monuments, museums, but this is a memorial. You can find meaning in things that aren't overtly political. It's no secret that golf has a segregated past. In the 1920s, if you were African-American and wanted to play golf in the nation's capital, there was only one course you could play without any restrictions. There was a, an original course for African Americans that was based around the Lincoln Memorial, but as the 1920s progressed, the area around the Lincoln Memorial became more and more of a popular space for visitors. The construction of the Memorial Bridge brought a lot of traffic to this space and really was kind of the impetus for the golf course closing. Because of the lack of courses African Americans were permitted to play, two groups formed to help fight that discrimination. The all-male Royal Golf Club and the all-female Wake Robin Golf Club. Together, they continued to petition the Department of Interior to grant them a new public course to play in the city. In order to make it a law, or make it a proclamation, generally it takes a political act. And we as black America and African America has most of our life gotten what we have gotten because of a political act. In 1939, because of its original white performers only policy, Constitution Hall denied singer Marian Anderson the right to perform there. So on Easter Sunday, Secretary of the Interior Harold Ickes arranged for Anderson to sing at the Lincoln Memorial instead. Over 75,000 people showed up. Two months later, on permission granted by Secretary Ickes, a course for African Americans opened on the banks of the Anacostia River. Langston is no just regular golf course here in Washington, D.C. It is owned and operated by the federal government through the National Park Service. When Secretary Ickes made the decision to uh, have Langston built, that opened the door, if you would. What Langston did for the royals, for African Americans, it was a home. And it brought organization. It was a regular meeting place every week. It was very important that they had a place where they could come and not be harassed. They're actually trying to end segregation especially on public venues where, you know, if you're a taxpayer, you should be able to play. The course opened in 1939, and, you know, it would be great to sort of say everything was, was rosy here, but the conditions were poor. Members of the Royals and Wake Robins really were pushing to gain access to the other golf courses. In June of 1941, members of the Royal Golf Club made a brave decision. They showed up to East Potomac, an all-white public course also run by the national parks, and began to do what they loved. They played golf. Police were called, insults were made, and the decision forced the National Park Service to react. The very next day, 
Secretary Ickes issued an order to open public golf courses to all players, no matter the color of their skin. Ickes pretty much in short order decreed that national parks needed to be integrated. That was the, the start, the spark. It was important in the desegregation because the men and women in the community helped the African-American folks no longer be the carrier of the bags, but the participants in the game. In 1945, the National Parks officially called for full integration across all of its properties. As time moved on, most of golf, unfortunately, stayed rooted in the past. But Langston remained a safe haven for all African Americans, hosting both amateurs and professionals. The UGA is the United Golfers Association. African American golfers could not play on the PGA Tour because of the Caucasian only clause. Those struggles and those stories have been told here on the fairways at Langston. Lee Elder, the first black man to play in the Masters, taught at and even managed Langston for a while. Other golfers like Charlie Sifford and Calvin Peet regularly visited. And throughout the years, Langston's reputation grew. Langston has a history not only with the, the common day golfer, but the entertainment side of society as well. Billy Eckstein, Ella Fitzgerald, Dion Warwick, Bill Russell. Now, I've seen President Ford Bob Hope, Mike Tyson. We have a part five here. There was a tree. The tree is known as the Joe Lewis tree, because every time he played that hole, he hit his ball in that tree. I was about 12 or 13 years old. A car pulled up into the parking lot, and when I realized it was Muhammad Ali, and he said, God, you know, I've never picked up a golf club in my life, and he took my putter and just struck a ball and just kind of smiled and laughed. Although many heavyweights of society have made their way to Langston over the years, today it continues to be a home for anyone that comes through its doors. Everybody come here is a part of history. You go anywhere in the world and speak golf, they understand what you're talking about, because they play the same game. Because of a new agreement between the National Park Service and the National Lynx Trust, Langston will continue to add to its legacy for years to come. It's a beacon of life for this community. Langston has to stay vibrant and viable and accessible for this community for them to have a place to call their own. It's important to tell the story to the next generation of golfers. Golf has had a very tangled history with race and diversity. But when you see the kids, you feel like the best days for golf and the best days for Langston are surely ahead. Our thanks to Jeffrey Wright for narrating that story. He actually grew up playing courses like East Potomac and Langston in D.C. The National Lynx Trust is also hoping to help build a home for Howard University's golf team at Langston, which would really bring the story full circle because Langston Golf Course was actually named after John Mercer Langston, the first dean of Howard's Law School.